Hello, everyone. My name is William Mucker. I am a client executive with Camaplan and would like to thank you all for joining us for today's webinar, Tequila Distillery Opportunity with Ryan Dolder and Brian Rathjen of KAM Alternatives. As a quick note, please be aware that Ryan and Brian will be answering questions at the end of the presentation. However, feel free to use the chat and or Q&A function on your screen to pose your questions whenever they cross your mind. They will be saved and addressed once the presentation portion ends and the Q&A portion begins. Uh, before we get started, we do have a brief disclosure to go through. Everything presented in today's webinar is strictly for educational purposes. Camaplan is a neutral third-party administrator of IRAs. We are not attorneys, CPAs, or financial advisors. If it comes to a time where you need advice in any one of those fields, we highly recommend you consult with your team of professionals. We are more than happy to be a part of that conversation with your team of professionals to make sure the investment process is quick and seamless. We do not sell any investments at Camaplan, <laughs> nor do we endorse any products. We highly uh, we will never call you about the next best investment opportunity. We believe that you should always do your own due diligence before investing your money, whether it be your retirement funds or otherwise. Once you have found the investment that is right for you, we will help you open your account, fund that account, and facilitate the transaction into that investment. Here is my contact information. If you or anyone that you know who you believe can benefit from the information have any questions about what is discussed in the presentation today and how it applies to self-direction, please do not hesitate to contact me. I would be more than happy to help. And without further ado, I'll pass the controls over to you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, William, and thank you everyone for joining today. Um, I'm going to give a brief introduction to myself, uh, Brian Rathjen. I've been in the institutional fundraising uh, marketplace since 2001. Um, in 2010, I started a, a broker dealer called Kelson Capital, where we were raising institutional uh, capital for institutional uh, funds. And uh, about two and a half years ago, my partner and I started a registered investment advisor called Kelson Asset Management. And the purpose of our platform really was to bring institutional quality investments to um, uh, smaller investors, folks who did not want to uh, write a check for a million dollars, but they wanted access to good quality product um, and good investment opportunities with smaller checks. Um, so right now we've got about 600 uh, investors. Um, and about 14 different special purpose vehicles. Um, and if you are interested in, in, in coming into this investment or others, you know, I'd love to spend some one-on-one uh, -on -one time. I like to have personal relationships with all of our clients. We kind of started out, as, like I said, two and a half years ago with family and friends, and that's kind of grown to their family and their friends, et cetera. So this is really the first time that uh, we're doing something outside of uh, kind of our family and friends circle. In this particular instance, today we're here to talk about a, a tequila um, uh, opportunity that uh, Ryan Dalder is heading up. And Ryan's been a friend for a number of years and uh, came to me with this idea and I personally wanted to invest. Um, Ryan was looking to raise $7.9 million of equity at a $16.8 million valuation to uh, acquire a distillery down in the tequila region of Mexico. And I won't steal any of Ryan's thunder. He can tell you why this, why we think this is a good opportunity. Um, it was a million dollar um, minimum. So we put together a special purpose vehicle at PAM, Kelson Asset Management, where we're taking smaller investors, folks who want to write checks as small as 25,000. We've got a couple of checks. Uh, I think our biggest check is is four hundred thousand dollars. We put it into a special purpose vehicle, and we present that to Ryan's group as one investor. And um, right now, we've raised a little over five and a half million dollars since we started this about six weeks ago. We've acquired the distillery, so now we're just looking to round out the uh, the raise. We've got about two and a half million dollars left, and that is uh, for operations and to expand the production. Uh, um, uh, capability of the distillery. I'll let Ryan talk about the opportunity. I'm going to put my contact information um, in the chat room and feel, feel free to reach out if you're interested in, in learning more about uh, CAM or if you're interested in this uh, opportunity. Uh, it's a pretty straightforward um, uh, process. We're looking to uh, get signed documents back from everyone via DocuSign. Uh, by November 8th, and then the money would be wired um, uh, to us, I think it's November 17th, but we'll have details uh, for that. Um, that's a really quick introduction. I think it's very important when you invest with somebody, you know who they are, 
So uh, we can have follow on conversations uh, about that. The way the SPV is set up is if you came in for a hundred thousand dollars, there's a three percent one time fee up front, and that's for legal and accounting and organizational fees. So you'd wire a hundred three thousand dollars. And then this particular investment, we're projecting we're going to have cash distributions uh, starting in about 18 months. There'll be a 1% management fee on your investment. So if you invest $100,000 each year, it'll be taken out of the distribution. There'll be a $1,000 management fee. Once we start having cash distributions, you'll get all of your money back, your 3% and all of your management fees back first. And then the next dollar out, there'll be a 20% carry that'll be paid to CAM um, for that investment. And we can talk more about that. We've got a whole PPM and all the documents for that. It took more time than I wanted to because Ryan's got some good content. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Ryan Dolder to talk about this particular opportunity. All right. Thanks, Brian. I'm going to attempt to share my screen here. So everybody I'm going to take my big head off, so. All right, hopefully everybody can see that. Uh, first off, I'd like to you know, thank everybody for taking the time to come on to uh, this presentation and learn about this particular investment opportunity. Um, being cognizant of everyone's time, knowing everyone's busy, I will um, attempt to go through this um, you know, fairly quickly so that we also have time at the end for any questions if anybody has them. But as I'm going through the presentation, if there's something that I, Maybe don't go into uh, enough detail and you have a question on. And if there's not enough time at the end to answer, ask that question, as Brian mentioned, and I think through Cam Plan, we'll figure out a way. Feel free to email any questions. I will respond to those immediately and get any answers back to you on anything. But I also don't want everybody to have to sit here um, for an hour straight and look at a presentation. I know that's not most people's favorite thing to do. But I'm excited to tell you about this. Um, as Brian mentioned, my name is Ryan Doler. I've been involved in the beverage industry for in, across numerous um, areas for a number of years, but specifically involved in the tequila industry the last seven years. We originally got into the industry developing our own tequila brands. And kind of through that process and learning and understanding how tequila is made, the production process, and some of the other areas in this industry we started to see other areas of opportunity and other areas of investment opportunity that could provide substantial returns. One of those key areas is, and kind of we realized it was a lot easier and a better business to produce the tequila and sell in bulk as opposed to trying to create a brand and sell a brand and compete with 2,000 other tequila brands on the shelf. And so we had always been looking for this particular opportunity, the right opportunity that came to us, and then we wanted to jump on it and capitalize on it. And that's what we're doing with this, this particular distillery uh, through relationships we built over the, the last seven years in Mexico. Uh, a particular individual who owned this distillery, he was not involved in the tequila industry, but he was leasing the facility to a brand who was doing production. He was ready to just kind of be done with it and be out of it. And, um, and actually, because of the way the industry is right now, and you'll see in the presentation, operating distilleries don't come available very often, but when they do, they um, they are at a premium, and he saw an opportunity to sell, so he came to us and asked if we'd be interested in, in acquiring it, and so we, uh, knowing the opportunity, we jumped on it, and that's the purpose for, for raising this money and this particular investment opportunity. The... The first slide here is just kind of some of the basic questions about the investment and about you know the presentation and the business. Um, the key questions are what what am what are you investing in? It's an investment in tequila distillery, and as mentioned, it's it's a unique and rare opportunity to acquire an actual operating tequila distillery. Further in the presentation, you'll you'll kind of see the reasons why, and and that goes into the why uh, why should I get in this investment? Why is it interesting? It's the potential returns that can come from it. And it, again, it's it's the, the experience and the knowledge we've gained being in the industry and understanding where these areas of opportunity are that can provide um, not only substantial returns, but quick returns. And that's our goal, um, specifically with all of our shareholders who come in. It's 
not only producing these returns, but getting these quick returns um, and dividends back to our shareholders. And this opportunity can provide that. The where, and this might be obvious to some, but um, with tequila, tequila can only be reproduced in Mexico. It's governed and regulated by the Mexican government, very similar to how champagne is in France. And so the where the opportunity is, it's in Mexico. But the the best part about that, and, and again, this will be um, touched on in the presentation, is it creates significant barriers to entry for others to get into this space. And that, that's why we're excited about this. We're on the inside, we're a part of it, and there, but there's significant barriers for somebody to just say, oh, I wanna wake up and start a tequila distillery. It's not really possible. And so, and, and that goes back to the rules and regulation governing how tequila is produced. When, as soon as possible, as mentioned, we wanna jump on this and capitalize on this opportunity right now. And largely because of where tequila as a category is projected to, to go over the next five to 10 years, it's projected to have significant growth. Probably many of you have kind of started to see it over the past few years. You see um, the tequila and, and the tequila cocktails and, and the different types of things more prevalent around. And that's kind of just speaks to where the category, category is going. We want to jump on that opportunity right now. Uh, the who is, you know, other than what am I investing in, the who is the, the, the next most important question who am I investing in? And that is an experienced team. It's a team that's been involved in this industry for many years. And that, that goes within our team. It goes from a tequila chemist to distillery engineers, all the way through to legal accounting, marketing, sales, um, that whole piece. We've all been, you know, we've been together and, and many of within our organization have been involved in the tequila industry for decades. And so one interesting piece, as you'll see in the presentation, is we're currently um, just small minority partners in a distillery, another distillery, one that we originally started out doing production in, but we're doing the operations and management of that facility. And we've had we've been doing that for a year and a half. And the key point is, is we're taking what we've learned, how to do what not to do, um, how to operate, uh, how to grow a distillery, we're taking all that experience and knowledge from that facility and bringing it to this distillery. And so that, so that team that will be leading this, this business has been doing this and not only across other areas for many years, but specifically with another distillery over the past year and a half. And so that, that's an important piece. We're not going into this blind, trying to figure it out from day one. We, are, we know what we need to do. We're just taking that blueprint and bringing it over to this new facility. And the, how are we gonna produce those returns? It's focusing on three key areas of opportunity. And those three areas are bulk tequila production, aging of tequila, and then the actual ownership of the distillery. We'll focus on those three key pieces and those three key pace, pieces, you know, being in the industry and understanding how things work, we feel that we focus on those three key areas. That's what's going to provide the returns to our shareholders and investors. This first slide is just a few statistics about tequila. Um, I won't go into each one, but I, the one that always kind of stands out to me is the bottom one. Tequila is projected to overtake vodka in revenue in the U.S. by the end of this year. Why that's um, interesting and important is five years ago, no one thought that tequila was going to overtake whiskey in the second spot. They thought it was impossible, never going to happen. Well, a couple of years ago, tequila did overtake whiskey in that second spot, and now it's projected to overtake vodka who's been king of the hill for decades uh, as the number one uh, spot as, as far as uh, revenue in the United States. And it just kind of shows to where tequila as a category is going. And again, it shows to what we want to capitalize on as that growth continues to pick up and go forward. Why tequila? A lot of people might say, well, you know, why would I invest in tequila? Uh, it's something I never even thought of, never even realized I might have an opportunity to. Um, so it can be kind of new to a lot, but really the reason why is we're currently in the stages of an, an industry that's expected to experience remarkable growth over the next five to 10 years. And having the distillery and being involved in this side of the business in the bulk production, we have an opportunity to capitalize on that growth. As you can see, the global tequila market, you know, right now is roughly nine and a half billion. It's projected over the next uh, five to 10 years to get to over 24 billion. And the industry experts, people much smarter than I am, um, project this growth coming from multiple different areas. 
One is obviously the growth in the U.S. will continue to accelerate. New brands will continue to come into the market. But where they really see the biggest growth coming from is the worldwide growth, the growth outside of the United States and Mexico. What's interesting is, and there's multiple percentages within there, but anywhere from 80 to 90% of all tequila consumed right now is consumed in the United States or Mexico. But what's happening is, is now that people are starting to understand tequila more, it's becoming more premium. Um, the, the kind of the opinion of tequila has changed drastically over the last few years. Now, other parts of the world are starting to discover tequila and they're starting to, to become uh, attracted to it and starting to drink it more. And so that's where the, the experts in the industry feel the growth over the next five to 10 years is going to happen. And it's really only scratched the surface in many of these countries. But what I always say is uh, Diageo didn't acquire Casamigos for a billion dollars just to focus on the U S market. They bought it to focus and use their power and their dollars to educate and expand that worldwide. And so these big companies like a Diageo are helping to educate consumers in other, other markets, which is leading to the growth in the demand for tequila. And that's where we're positioning ourselves and this, this opportunity. What I like to say, and if there's one thing you remember from this presentation at all, it's this piece is I, I like to say, we sell the picks and shovels. Many have probably heard that phrase before, but in the 1800s, when the prospectors flooded out to California to prospect for gold, there was the old saying that, you know, the only people who really made any money were the people selling the picks and shovels. And that's what we do. We're going to sell the tequila. Essentially, we're selling the picks and shovels to the world. We're selling the tequila to, to supply into that demand and into the worldwide demand. Um, the key piece about this is, as opposed to starting a brand, um, which as many of you probably seen, it seems like everybody wants to do that nowadays. The issue with that is when you start a brand, you're now in the market and competing against 2000 other tequilas. And you're looking at those, those competitors, hoping they all fail so that you can succeed. Well, where we sit as a supplier, as a bulk producer, as a distillery is we're cheering for all of them. We love it when new brands come into the market. We love it when, current brands continue to grow because that just means there's more demand for supply. And that's where we sit. We're a supplier and we're a supplier to everybody. And so that's, that's the biggest piece of why we feel this is a, a great investment in the big area of opportunity. It's being that supplier uh, as opposed to trying to compete against everybody. We're supplying everybody. Again, kind of a little, a couple more things about why tequila and things I just touched on, but it's a, tequila, it's a tequila growth. It's what's going to happen outside of the U.S. and Mexico, where it's heading the next five to 10 years. Um, the worldwide market, amazingly, currently, currently tequila only makes up 3% of the global spirits market. So there's a huge runway for growth there. And, and one of those markets and kind of the obvious market everybody always talks about too is, well, what about China? Well, what's interesting with China is in 2008, up until 2008, they had a ban on tequila imports. And so essentially that market knew nothing about tequila. Once that ban was lifted, uh, that consumer started to be able to learn and understand tequila. And a lot of these big brands, the Cuervos and the Herraduras started to kind of push into that market and educate that consumer more. And so now in a massive market like that, people are starting to understand and try tequila. And that because of that, over the next decade, they expected to grow by 20%. All that is going to feel the need for more supply, which is where we sit again. The tequila rules, tequila, again, can only be produced in Mexico in certain jurisdictions um, under certain rules. And because of that, it's creating significant barriers to entry. So again, going back to that competition piece, it's very difficult for, for comp competitors to get into this side of the market, which is a big advantage to us. The limited distilleries, and, and part of that, feeds into why there's so few distilleries in for production of tequila. Currently, there are only 150 tequila distilleries in the world, 74 of which are operational, and one of them happens to be us. And so when you're looking at the landscape of the market, you essentially have 74 distilleries that have to supply the entire worldwide demand, which leads to a huge opportunity. But again, part, a lot of these rules around the governing and how they govern tequila 
makes it difficult for new distilleries to come in and start quickly. So being one of those operating distilleries is a huge advantage to us. And because of that, it's creating opportunities for significant return on investment. And that's most important for, for us and our shareholders is that the supply and demand here is creating um, not only a huge need for the supply, but it's creating high margins. And you're starting to see the increased frequency of buyouts, whether it's in distilleries or brands. And, and what you'll see in the presentation a few slides from now, you know, part of owning this distillery and having this valuable asset is there's, you know, the way the market is going, there's an opportunity that the distillery can be a potential buyout target. And um, depending on what that is and when that is, that's also going to provide a huge return for our shareholders. And the final piece of celebrity and athlete brands, many of you probably seen, you know, it's, it's like a new celebrity every day is putting this their name on tequila. Again, being a supplier, we love it because it means that it's that it's only creating more of a need for supply. But a lot of times the celebrity marketing and awareness, it, it's what's well, bringing more awareness to tequila as a category. And it's just, it's bringing new consumers into the market. And so that all feeds into what we're, you know, our business model and what we're trying to do. So it's all creating a good scenario for being a producer of tequila. Um, the, uh, sorry, I've cut off here. Um, that's creating some of the problems in, in tequila. Some of these problems are leading to our opportunities and what we're kind of leaning into. Again, the worldwide growth. There's not enough, you know, that, that goes to the limited distilleries. There's not enough distilleries to supply where the worldwide market is going. Um, the influx of new brands, there's so many brands coming in and there's, they're all in search of supply. So it's, it's cr creating a situation in the industry where there's not enough supply for the demand and for all these new brands. The big brands are at capacity. Um, a lot of times I get asked, well, why don't the big big brands like Cuervo and Herradura, why don't they just make more tequila? Well, they're all at capacity. Um, not only are they producing for their own brands, which are massive brands to begin with, they do do other third-party private label brands. And so they're at capacity. And where an opportunity for us um, comes in is, and currently it's, it's happening at our other distillery, is a, a company like Cuervo will come to smaller distilleries like us and buy tequila from us to su supplement their production. They're at capacity. The other, the other reason is what these big distillers have realized is they're so massive that to add on and increase their capacity is extremely expensive. They, you know, they're, they're generally because they're so big, they're held to higher regulatory standards. So there's a lot of red tape they have to go through, um, a lot of operational costs, a lot more people they need. So they realize it's a lot easier to just buy additional tequila from smaller distilleries like our, like ourselves. So that's that's a customer. Those are the types of customers we will sell bulk tequila to, the, the, the big brands who need more supply. One key piece, the premium tequila growth, the expressions of aged tequila like uh, Reposado, Añejo, and Extra Añejo are growing faster than suppliers can keep up with. The consumer has kind of moved towards more premium, uh, more pre premium tequila, the, the aged tequila, and that growth has happened so quickly that the supply has fallen behind. And so part of our strategy and part of our plan in this in this bulk production is to put away uh, tequila in barrels to age it so that we can provide supply and, and sell into that demand. But right now there's a huge glut of supply because of what's happening in the market. So there's a huge opportunity there as well. Industry knowledge, this is holding people back and this is what's also stopping distilleries from popping up everywhere. It's, it's limited industry knowledge. If you understand you know, a lot of the regulation around tequila, what it takes, how to produce tequila, um, which is a benefit to us because we do understand it. We know how to do it, but that is what's keeping, you know, people out. It's keeping um, people from just coming down and opening up distilleries. And so again, it's a problem, but it's a opportunity for us. And then the license and approvals. This is a key piece as well. Part of the acquisition of, of the distillery is we acquired the production license that uh, for the facility. And that's called a gnome. If if you have a bottle of tequila or you're looking at them on the shelf, on the label, usually on the back, you'll see N-O-M and then a number. And that number 
ties that tequila back to where it was produced. It ties it back to a specific distillery. You have to get that license to be able to produce te te tequila. Now, what's happening right now is a couple of years ago, the CRT, which is the te Tequila Regulatory Commission, which governs the production of tequila, changed the rules for someone to just start up a distillery. Right now, you have to actually outlay the capital and build a distillery, and then you have to produce tequila for six months to prove you can do it, and then apply, and they might give you a production license, and they might not. And so that those rules alone are keeping a lot of people away from even trying to get into the production piece of this business. It's a huge risk and a huge capital outlay just to kind of get the right to try and get that license. Again, a huge opportunity for us because we have that license and we have the facility. So that leads to our opportunity. Some of the things I just touched on, the distillery, we've acquired the distillery, which gives us the ability to supply into that demand and feed the market as this growth continues over the next five to 10 years. The experienced team, as I've touched on multiple times, uh, the contracts and customers, we already have multiple contracts and customers in place to buy the tequila, much more than we can actually supply. Um, at our other facility, we have far more uh, production contract um, demand than can be supplied over there. So that part of that's also coming to this facility. So we have built in customers and contracts ready to go. Um, you know, that we've had multiple large customers like Cuervo and uh, Campo Azul come to us looking for millions of liters over, you know, a year, two year period. So those opportunities are there. We have those in place, ready to go day one. We have the ability to age tequila. This goes back to the part about the premium tequila growth. We have the knowledge and understanding of how to uh, age tequila and what to do. And in part of our distillery, we also have a large warehouse where we'll be able to house anywhere from 4,000 to 5,000 barrels. And part of our plan and our projections project into um, putting away specific amounts each production cycle into barrels so that 12 months later, we can turn around and sell that as in Yeho. And as you'll see too, coming up, the drastic difference in the margins and profits when we do that. And then the opportunity is we have the production license. They, extremely valuable piece. Um, and that was you know, part of the, not only is it distillery and the asset valuable, but having that production license is extremely valuable. And uh, we look to take advantage of that. So all that said, we're raising the money to capitalize on this opportunity now. Um, we feel now's the time we can get in kind of on the beginning of this massive growth. As Brian mentioned, we were initially set up to raise 7.9 million. Uh, we've raised the 5 million. We've acquired the distillery. Now we're remaining the uh, raising the remaining 2.9 million for um, largely the operating capital and, and the items below here, the capex, which uh, happens. It's that's basically the equipment that's going to take us from 60,000 liters a month up to 240,000 liters a month. The bulk production that money is essentially acts as a revolving line of credit. It's the raw materials, cost of goods that go into each production turn. And so, what happens with the production turn? of tequila. And, and generally we sell in 20,000 to 30,000 liter lots, but from the start of a production cycle to the sale is roughly 30 to 45 days. And so what happens when we sell that tequila, we take the profit out, set it aside, take that original um, cost of goods money and put it right back into another cycle. And it just kind of continues to go over and over. We have some money in there for facility upgrades. Um, the particular distillery we purchased is in very good is in very good shape, but we're going to upgrade and continue to build the value in that asset because, as mentioned, you know, three to five to seven years down the road, there, you know, it's in our opinion that there will be an opportunity uh, for a buyout, and so we want to continue to do upgrade the facility and then some organizational costs as a part of that raise as well. Now, the key areas of opportunity that we will focus on, as I mentioned, bulk production tequila, the demand is far outweighing the supply, you know, only 74 operating distilleries. Um, so what we want to do is we want to lean into that. The production to sales cycle happens fast, as mentioned. So it gives us the ability to generate cash returns quickly. And that's a key piece to this, a key piece to our shareholders. What we want to do is we want to, we want to get this thing going, get this thing turning so that we can continue to just turn it over and over and get those cash returns and dividends back to our shareholders. That's the main goal of this entire business. And that's that's why we 
we focused on this particular opportunity because it, it can provide that. The aging of tequila, like whiskey, tequila's value increases with age. The beauty is it all starts out as Blanco. You can produce it for $5 a liter, but you can sell it for upwards of anywhere from to $30 to $40 a liter after it sits in a barrel for 12 months. And so we're going to take advantage of that piece as well. Um, again, leaning into that premium tequila area that's growing uh, the, the fastest there in the subsector and then the Reposado and Yeho. And so we're going to look to produce an age into Añejo. And the last piece is distillery ownership. This goes kind of the piece of building up that asset. It's a, it's a huge asset. It's a great asset for us. Um, there are limited distilleries in the world. So there's a huge demand actually for you know people trying to get into this. Owning a distillery significantly increases our production margins. And operating distilleries right now are selling at a premium. And we only see that getting higher over the next three to five years. Um, you know, distiller recently is really pr producing a million liters a month, sold for $300 million. You know, we will, we don't have the space to go to a million, but we're going to get up to 300,000. And so, you know, you can kind of, kind of deduce where that sits and where that, where that allows our facility to sit at that point. Now here are the projections and the top two boxes are just kind of the, the basic economics of selling a bulk production. Now, when you're selling bulk Blanco tequila, like I mentioned, generally sold in 20 to 30,000 liter lots, um, the cost produced per liter is, is roughly $5. That can fluctuate based on the, the cost of goods, and specifically the agave. The start to sale cycle is a month to month and a half. And then what you see is the, the per liter sale price, when we're selling to distilleries like a Cuervo or Herradura, it's generally a lower margin, but it's um, a higher volume turn and, and faster turns with distilleries, but when you sell specifically to brands, you can sell at a higher margin. What we have built in our projections is a kind of a ratio where to get going, um, more of our sales will be to the distilleries to get that going, get that cash flow going, start to get those returns. But then we'll involve, eventually start to factor in more brands so we can take advantage of this higher margins and higher and larger profits. But then, so based on that, and you can kind of see where the revenue of a 30,000 liter lot sits and then what the gross profit is. On the economics of an Inejo a tequila, you, you take 20 to 30,000 liters of Blanco, put it in barrels and age it for 12 months. And the cost of produce is the same. It's the $5 a liter. The start to sale is at 12 months. It must sit in the barrel for 12 months. But then what you can see is the per liter sale price to distilleries and to brands is drastically higher than obviously selling Blanco. And so the because of those large margins and opportunity and those higher profits there, that's why each production cycle, we're going to continue to put that uh, tequila away in barrels so that in month one, we put 20,000 liters away. Then come month 13, we can sell those 20,000 at those types of prices and make much larger margins on that tequila. And that kind of factors into the, in the five-year summary, you'll see kind of the jump from year one to year two, especially year one, the negative there is basically all the tequila that's, that will be sitting in barrels aging. And so it, that is essentially there sitting. And then in year two, starting in month 13 is when we start selling that Añejo. And that's what really starts to um, spike up the revenue and starts to build those returns. And then it grows out for, for five years. And you see after five years, our projecting that returns from the business is 26.6 million plus the initial bulk production money back. That's the money that's essentially the revolving line of credit for the bulk production turns with a total of being uh, upwards of 28 million. Now, going the one piece I want to hit on again is the kind of the exit strategy, the big exit strategy. You know, part of our overall strat overall business is to is to build up the distillery, build up that value, and possibly sell it at some point. Now, if we're at year five and we're, and we're turning cash and making a lot of money and, and getting dividends back to our shareholders, you know, it's a decision we can, you know, we can debate and go back and forth with and try and figure out, depending on what, you know, a possible offer is for a buyout. But we will look at some point, uh, based on we, where we feel the market going, that at some point, as we get going and build this up, somebody is going to come in and offer us a premium for the distillery and we will look at that and decide if that's the right time. And when we do it, obviously that's a huge return to all of our shareholders. And that, that's the key piece. And that's why 
I'm so excited about the fact that we've acquired this asset. We now have this asset and this opportunity will come to us at some point. And as you can see here, based on the industry comps on a distillery producing 240,000 liters a month, where we want to get to uh, within 12 to 18 months, the valuations right now on those facilities are anywhere from 30 to 40 million. So how are we going to get to these returns? How are we going to produce these returns? There's five key ways. One is the distillery. You know, that having the distillery gives us the ability to, to produce the tequila and supply into that demand and supply our contracts. That's where that opportunity lies. Patriota, now that's the other distillery that we've been operating. Um, what we're doing is, again, basically taking that knowledge and experience and replicating that model and bringing it over to this facility. So that's a key piece. We, we know exactly what we need to do and how to do it. And we're bringing that over to this distillery. The team, as mentioned, the team has number of years of experience, that whole team is also coming over to this facility and will be operating and running it. The contracts, again, going back to the contract, we already have the contracts in place for buyers. It's more than we can actually fulfill. Um, to be honest, if we had a facility that could do a million liters a month, we would not have enough production capacity to fill all of it. So the, there's a lot of room there and a lot of opportunity. And then again, the market, where it's going. The, you know, over the next five to 10 years, they predicted the golden years of tequila. So we want to get into it now and take advantage of it and ride that wave all the way through. So this is, I just mentioned about Patriota. What we're basically doing is we acquired um, what is called La Perla right now, but we are planning to change that name. But so when I refer to La Perla, that is the distillery name right now. We acquired La Perla. And we're basically replicating the model on our first distillery, Patriota. Patriot was a worn out facility, it was serviceable, it had the capacity to produce 30,000 liters a month. Um, the, the majority owners had an opportunity to purchase it at a, at a relatively low price to the market. They purchased it for $6 million in September of 2022. They've added an additional $3 million in upgrades. It now has a, the capacity to do 300,000 liters a month. Um, it's protected to do close to $16 million in revenue this year. But it was just appraised uh, after, you know, basically a year, just appraised at 18 million. I was actually down at the facility about a month ago when somebody walked up, basically knocked on the gate and asked if they would sell a distillery and offered them 30 million to sell it. Um, and so those types of things are happening now in the industry because of where the category is going. Uh, but they have kind of a vision for how they want to build it out. And once that facility is completely finished, you know, running at full capacity, the projected valuation of that facility would be around 50 million. So what we want to do is we're taking that as a blueprint and bringing it to this distillery. And that brings us to our opportunity, our distillery. Um, again, because, because of the demand and the growth in tequila, it is rare that an operating functional distillery comes available. It came to us, we got it, we jumped on it, we now own it. We've acquired the distillery. Again, part of the purchase price was that acquisition of the license. That's a key and valuable piece. Currently, the facility has a capacity to produce 60,000 liters a month. That's where we'll start out immediately. We'll start producing into that 60,000 liters while, while we expand up to 120, 240, and then potentially to 300,000 liters a month. Included in that was all the current equipment, bottling lines, the warehouse for that barrel storage, uh, storefront, and then three acres of land. What's interesting and, and important about this too, and important about the value of the asset, is it's located near the town of Tequila. And it, being near the town of Tequila is significant in the tequila industry because 90% of the brands you see on the shelf are produced within a 50 mile radius of the town of Tequila. And you know, right, you'll you'll start to see stuff about the highlands and the lowlands. The highlands is relatively new. There's some production in that area, but the lowlands, which is tequila, is where a majority of the te tequila product is made. Mexico just the Mexican government just recently labeled the town of tequila as a Pueblo Magico, which is a magic city, meaning they've earmarked substantial amount of investment in development over the next 10 years. And part of the reason they're doing that is because there is a massive growth in tequila tourism, much like people go to, to Napa and Sonoma uh, in, in wine country and people go to Kentucky on the bourbon trail, the tequila trail is, is fastly becoming a thing. And significant amount of tourists are coming down doing the tequila trail and our distillery sits right in the middle of that and so all of that and all that development is only going to build up our asset and make our distillery even more valuable and the plan is 
to utilize the same model we use on Patriota, upgrade the facility, increase the production capacity, drive that production revenue, and then grow the value of the property. And again, if we can get it up to 300,000 liters a month within three, three, four years, you know, we're looking at a, a valuation based currently on what things are going for at around $50 million. So that that's that's kind of the plan, um, the plan with this facility. You know, our advantages here kind of go back to what I've touched on a few times in the presentation. We've already been operating distilleries. We've already been producing bulk tequila. We've 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 been involved in agave plants. We've done farming of agave, the aging of tequila, and then developing a brands. And a key piece going to those contracts and, and the buyers that we have lined up. Um, we don't have enough distillery capacity to meet the amount of that we have within contracts. We had been approached by Casamigos to produce 14 million, million liters of tequila over the next three years. Obviously, I had to turn that down because we don't have the capability to do that. They did say, if you ever have the capability to do that, we will give you this contract. But we don't have the capability to do that much. Uh, Kappa Azul, they came to us looking to do 9 million liters over the next two years. And largely, that was because of the Rock brand, Terramana. They are currently producing for the Rock. And because of how fast his brand has grown, they're out of capacity. So they came to us looking to supplement their, their production. And, and again, it was a, a larger amount than we have the ability to, to do. So th that was on hold. And then we were recently approached by Cuervo to do 10 million liters per year. This is interesting. We've been working on this with them, trying to figure out a way to, to do some of this, because what we've seen in the industry, as I mentioned, these larger brands and distilleries coming to the smaller distilleries for production, there's a mandate within the Cuervo organization to go out and partner with three to four smaller distilleries to supplement their production with the idea of building that relationship. And then over the next few years, looking to acquire those facilities. So on, on, on the initial first hand, we just want to, you know, our plan is to get in business with them to be able to produce you know, produce tequila, have those contracts lock, locked up, which means returns to our shareholders. But then it's also, you know, potentially building that relationship as a potential buyout option down the road from them. And then we kind of see that starting to happen. It used to never, no one ever, ever did that in this industry. The big guys usually didn't acquire smaller distilleries, but that's now um, starting to happen because of the way the market is going. This slide is just, you know, some information about some of the team uh, that, you know, when everybody gets the presentation, you can read through that. I won't bore you with that right now. Um, and then the final piece is just the appendix. And this is another piece of, of reading that everybody can kind of look at in their free time if they want. You know, I had a lot of people said, hey, I don't know much about tequila. You know, what are kind of some of the basics of tequila? This slide is just kind of some of the basics of tequila. Um, <laughs> some of the real simplistic um, definitions of certain things. The next is just some more information about, you know, why, why would I invest in tequila? You know, where is it going? What's the opportunity? These are just some more statistics that um, you can look at. This slide is the tequila rules, kind of what, what governs, governs tequila and makes it special and also creates those barriers to entry. These are the, a lot, a lot of the rules in the, in the, um, the map there, you can see the jurisdictions where, te te excuse me, where tequila can be produced. Obviously, the location of our distiller is right smack in the middle of it. But um, this it's interesting because these are uh, difficult rules for people to just kind of get up one day again and say, I want to get involved in tequila. This, this makes it difficult, but we're on the right side of that and on the good side of that, and that helps us, and, and we're looking to take advantage of that. The last slide, which is some recent acquisitions in M&A in, in tequila, um, what's interesting here is obviously, you know, everybody's probably heard about Casamigos being bought for a billion dollars, but what we love about that, and this is the difference of being a supplier as opposed to a brand owner, your brand owner, you see that happen, you know, it's, it's, it's a competitor getting a big buyout. It's not you, you know, it's, it's frustrating, but with us as a supplier, we love it when these massive conglomerates buy out these brands, because all that means is their muscles now are going to be put behind that brand and that brand is going to grow significantly. And guess what? They're going to need more supply. And particularly with Casamigos, when they sold to Diageo the year before they sold, they did about roughly 120,000 cases worldwide. 
I think, and I believe that was in 2017, 2018. Um, Diageo came in and just in 2022, that was already up to 3.2 million cases. And so there was a massive increase with Diageo's muscle behind it. But that was part of the reason they had come to us looking for more supply. So anytime one of these brands is bought out for a significant amount, we love it because we know what it's going to mean. It's going to, it's going to mean more tequila is needed. That brand is going to grow. And so being a supplier, we will look to capitalize on it. All that said, um, you know, we believe this is, a, a, again, it's, it's a different opportunity. It's a unique opportunity, but we think it's a great opportunity. And we think it's a great opportunity because of the market and the way things are going and a lot of the way things are set up and a lot of the problems that are creating our opportunity. And again, we're raising the final 2.9 million to get this thing rolling. And we would love to have um, anybody and everybody involved. And as a shareholder, um, what we really want to do and, and our main goal is to get this going and start getting returns back to people as quickly as possible. And I, I know that our goal is 18 months, but we're going to do everything to uh, speed that up. And we, we believe internally that, you know, if we can get things going um, as quickly as possible, it, it can be before that. And so we'll look to do that. But all that said, I appreciate um, everyone's time for listening. And I'm happy to take any questions um, on any of it. <clears throat> yeah, Ryan, there's a couple of good questions in the chat room, if you can open those up. Okay, first one I see, sorry. What brands will this distillery have as clients? I'll take that one first. Um, as mentioned, it's um, we, we currently have contracts in place with, there's a couple, the, actually the second and third largest tequila producers in the world are clients of ours. Um, one is a distillery called Casa Maestri. They do private label for over 400 brands. Uh, they have, and actually we were just in their distillery a couple months ago. It's not far from where this, where our distillery is. It's a massive, it's a billion dollar distillery essentially, but they do, um, I believe it's 40 million liters of tequila a year. And so, but they're at capacity, they can't keep up. And so they buy from us. Um, again, we Cuervo, uh, another uh, tequila producer called Idea is a massive uh, tequila producer. We have a contract with them to supplement their uh, production. And then um, we actually, you know, now that we've acquired the distillery, we've gone out and started to, um, get some of the brands that we have relationships with one of the brands that recently just signed up with us um last week uh no boxing no life which is canelo alvarez's brand he's bringing that production over to us um we are in fact we were contacted the other day by cisco the food service provider they're looking to do their own private label tequila so it's a it's a it, it's a little bit of blend of both you have the massive distilleries looking to supplement their production and then you have all these brands and, and like a Cisco, which is interesting. There's so many of these big corporations, it, the, the cruise lines have started to contact us. Um, and, and not only, and I will say not just us, but they're, look, they're contacting distilleries because they all want to do, now do their own private label tequila. And where we have an advantage here is we've, we've really started to look at over the last couple of months was this private label opportunity. You know, we're essentially vertical we have the distillery. Um, we actually have an import company. And so we can cut out a few pieces of the chain and that markup. So we can get particular you know, companies like a Cisco or a Royal Caribbean, their own private label, um, better tequila at a less cost than what they're currently buying. So those are the things we're going to continue to look at. But those are some of the, the current customers we have. Um, the next question was, and this is a good question. We get this all the time. Of the 150 distilleries, why are only 74 operational? The reason is, is uh, a lot of these licenses, the 150 licenses, have been in family have been in families for generations. Um, when they initially got the license, um, a lot of them just had a slab of concrete, and they said, "Hey, I'm going to get a license because I want to start a distillery." Many. 
things can happen, but one of the main things that happen is the, the people who get the license don't have the capital to actually build a distillery. You know, and it's one thing to build a distillery. It's another thing to have the capital to be the, to do the production. And so there's a lot of, you, you, you know, there's places where I've seen the slab of concrete that is actually has a distillery license attached to it, but there's nothing there um, for, for some of those reasons. Another reason is, and that's part of the reason why the CRT changed the rules about to get a production license. They noticed recently once tequila started to grow that people started to put in applications for these production license, licenses, but didn't have a facility, didn't have anything. They just wanted to get the license. And so the CRT quickly realized what was going on, which is why they implemented the rule where you, you actually have to build that distillery first, produce the tequila before we'll even think about approving you for a license. And so there was a number of those in there that just got the license, but didn't have a plan or the capital to even start a distillery. Um, so there's some of those, and and some of them are are just um, distilleries, really small distilleries that didn't have the business, uh, didn't have the business, and and shut down, um, you know, and didn't have the business in the sense that they, you know you still have to go out and get the customers, you still have to get the brands, and and there's you know certain sector that didn't have that capability, and so if they have a license, they might have a small facility, but it's not operating. What are the current companies you have contracts with? Um, I hope I, I think I just answered that. And what gnome do we own? You know what? I, I should know that. I think it's, I because I, I was just, we have multiple gnomes with the other facility. I, I believe it's 1498. I will check on that, but I believe it's gnome 1498. Um, with our gnome specifically, it has sat um, dormant in, in this company the current producer, that brand that was leasing out the facility, the distillery that we just acquired, they were they were producing under their gnome. So our, the company that we acquired had the gnome, which we place at this distillery. What we will do when we go in there is we do one, the first production run we do, the CRT comes out, monitors the production, takes samples. And then from that point, they activate our gnome. So um, I believe it's 1498 is the gnome, but I will, if I'm wrong, I will, I will let the people, let everybody know. And, and so that is, you know, if you have a specific uh, further question about that, I believe it's gnome 1498. Um, any more questions? I don't know if, okay. Um, it does look like there's one more question. I'm not sure if, if you touched on it um from william it says is <clears throat> excuse me is this an equity investment with depreciation of buildings and equipment or simply an interest bearing return with possible capital return when sold brian do you have a good answer for that one because i i i don't want to answer it incorrectly but it's we're having it looked at right now just I, I think the safest thing to do is view it as a, a um uh the latter which is expect um you know distributions and then uh, getting money, uh, capital gains on the uh, exit. I am going down to Mexico. We've got a CFO named Kevin McGowan, who used to be the CFO for duty-free shops. He's done a lot of work down in Mexico, but we'll get you a definitive answer. That could be an upside surprise if we could offset some of the um, ups, offset some of the distributions with uh, depreciation. But we'll have an answer for that. Great. Well, it looks like that's all of the questions at the moment. So I want to thank everybody for attending. I want to thank uh, thank Brian and Brian for the presentation and all the information, lending their time to us. Um, and one more time, if you want to, if you want to give people the contact information for those that might be watching this recording at a later date that didn't quite get to see the chat, and for those people that want to hear it again, just in case they have any questions. I think it's this. Um, can you see that? Is it have Brian's information there? uh i do not i think you're sharing a, a a specific window i think it was in the first chat yeah i was i have it up on my screen thinking that it might be sharing but it might must not yeah i think you're sh sharing a specific window and not the screen so um do you just want to read it up for... yeah sure it's b rathjen first initial last name b r a t h j e n at 
K A M L O C dot com. And I put my cell in there as well. My mobile is 646-245-2972. And the key with all the investments that we've done in the past, and I'll say this first, again, there's obviously this is risk, risk investment. This is not for your college kids, um, you know, uh, fund or, you know, you're, if you're saving money for your, 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 your daughter's wedding or what have you, this is risk capital. Uh, that's one that's inherent risk in every investment. And, um, I want everyone to, to come in like feeling fully informed. I think we do a pretty decent job of communicating. We're very transparent and, uh, you know, we'll have quarterly updates with all our investors and, um, you know, feel informed and comfortable. Don't, don't invest money that you feel like you're over your skis, uh, with, but I do, I, I like this investment because it is cash flowing and, um, Great. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. All right. So I'm sorry. I ran a little over. Thank you so no, much. No, no problem. I actually, before we wrap it up, we do have two more comments that I do want to address. Um, well, a comment and a question. So Kevin says that I thought SDIRAs were not allowed to invest in alcohol. That's correct. Uh, self-directed IRA is not allowed to purchase alcohol directly. Like say you buy a, the IRA wants to buy a bottle of wine, um, or a, some sort of collectible version of, uh, alcohol that is hard to value and may be worth one thing to somebody and something else to somebody else. Now that's not, that does not apply to companies that deal with alcohol. Um, like you can invest into privately, you know, traded companies or funds that are dealing with alcohol, um, in the industry, but it it just can't own a specific bottle or collectible sort of alcohol. Should I say, if that makes sense? Yeah. Yep. No problem. And then Melanie asks, I may have missed it, but what is the minimum investment? Yeah. So Melanie, the minimum, the stated minimum investment is 25,000, but we can have a separate conversation. You know, I've made accommodations for family and friends for for less than that, but the stated minimum would be 25,000. All right. Perfect. Thank you everybody for the questions, the the information and and lending your time with us today. Um, And I hope you have a great rest of your days. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.